Master Jim to come back for the invocation. So in the meantime, please complain to yourselves. <laughs> Carol and I were in our early 40s 
then recently moved into the area with their son Jeff and daughter Cindy and had not established a new church home. The land where the village is now was mostly vacant and you could shoot a cannon anywhere along 441 and not hit anyone until you got to Belgium. <laughs> we became members when one of the founders of this church, Wendy Yusbo, whom we were doing business with, invited us to join Gloria Day 34 years ago. The membership was growing, we had a Sunday school, and Gloria Day was in the beginning processes of expansion and adding the sanctuary, which we now enjoy. Our community membership at that time grew to over 400. And even though we had two Sunday services, there were times of the year that we had to set folding chairs down that center aisle to accommodate the overflow. Gloria Day, as do all churches, fall into one of three categories. One, they were either growing in membership. Two, have reached the plateau and are stabilized, whether they are either growing or declining. Or three, they are in decline, and unless changes are made, will ultimately die. In my opinion, Gloria Day falls under category three, which was made apparent to me a few years ago when I received an itemized list from our then Secretary Alice, listing all our commuting members. In comparison to the over 400 commuting members that were on the list at the time of Pastor Kemp's retirement, this list showed that our community membership had declined almost 50% to just over 200 community members. The opportunity and time to act bells were ringing and sounding some years ago. These bells became louder when a church elects to change a fundamental schedule of Sunday worship that has provided for the last 50 years from two services to one service. And finally, it was no surprise to me when in a conversation I had with Pastor Marilyn earlier this year, wherein she volunteered her thoughts confirming that Gloria Day was indeed in Category 3 decline. Now I want to add a third part of my presentation and why I'm standing here. And that is, if any of what I have already shared, or about to share, resonates, with your thinking or motivate you to expand on what I am saying, then I want to propose that our new pastor be able to meet us at our needs, be vision oriented, will have had experience in settings such as ours, and will not be over 50 years of age. The opening part of our ECL mission statement contains the following. Marked with the cross of Christ forever, we are claimed, gathered, and sent for the sake of the world. As members of the ECA, ELCA, we believe that we are freed in Christ to serve and love our neighbor. With our hands we do God's work of restoring and reconciling communities in Jesus' name throughout the world. It also says, at Gloria Day, we express the ECL's mission in our own words, gathering in Christ, sharing His love. There is an old adage that says, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I believe that if it is God's will, and we combine our time, talent, and treasury, along with the guidance of a new pastor, we have the opportunity to formulate a strategic plan that will not only stabilize, but will ultimately stay in this house of worship for those who are yet to come. As an example, population demographics, which can be used in evangelism growth, show that in the Leesburg Fruitland Park area, here alone, there are over 23,000 people, with 78% of them being less than 65 years of age. Additionally, 56, or almost 13,000, being over 18 but under 65 years of age. 
Outreach to these or other venues of opportunity would provide younger members who most likely would have families. And for less than the total cost that our church, plus over 300 member donations provided for our organ, we could have a modular four classroom Sunday school facility up and running in a couple of months. And I know that because as in the past, my capacity as a building contractor, I have dealt with these type of businesses throughout the state of Florida. This is just a glimpse, and but one of the many avenues of pursuits that we can put into motion if we choose to act proactively. In closing, I refer us to ask, uh, to think of Pastor Young's sermon a few weeks ago, where he held up one hand and asked, is this work? And then he lifted up his other hand and he asked, or is this worship? Sooner I asked, is this is what is best for me now? Or is this the time we call a younger pastor with vision and experience whose goal along with ours is to pay it forward and make a difference? Thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Scribes, did you get everything? <laughs> Forrest, can we have a copy of that then? Sometime. It's being recorded. I think this is the best time before we proceed to ask our treasurer, Linda Hyde, to come forward with a brief report on finances. Good morning. This is done a little bit differently. So, I am here today to give you a bit of an update on our finances. But first, I would like to ask how many of you were here for our last meeting where we talked about our finances? Good. That's a good show of hands. Um, you may remember that um, we voted to increase our giving to help us get out of the hole that we were currently in. Um, at the end of May, we were running in the red by about $13,000. Fortunately for this congregation, you came up with um, what we were asking. We are now um, Approximately twelve thousand dollars ahead of where we were this time last year. And when I say this time last year, I'm talking about the end of July. I, I do not have the numbers for August yet. I am really optimistic going forward um, for the financial state of this church, and I will explain to you a little bit about that in a minute and how it might apply to the call going forward because that's what we're here for today. So. We are currently now in the hole by about seventeen hundred dollars, which is a good sign that we are all giving more, and we're all coming up to the plate to help this church survive. And I really appreciate that. Having said that, we are saving approximately five thousand dollars a month by not having a pastor right now. Okay. Full-time pastor. <laughs> 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 I have to say, um, I'm just going to add this. I, my last church went through three calls in 30 years. And it takes a long time. The process is long. And congregations tend to lose members during that call process. I am pleased to say from my own point of view here and looking around at you all, I don't think that's going to happen with this church. 
We are all here because we love this facility, we love this church, and we love the message that we get. I think that going forward, if we continue the way that we're going with our giving, I encourage you to do that. Um, I think we are going to be in pretty good shape financially at the end of the year. What I would like to see is a cushion going forward, but probably it's going to be a year, maybe longer, before we actually call a new pastor here. It would be really nice if we um, were ahead of him when that pastor finally arrives, whoever that may be. Also, I'd like to let you know, um, I'm usually in church on Sundays. I'm a full-time resident of this area, although I'm in and out during the summer because I do do some traveling. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop and ask me. I would be happy to let you know how things are going. I also updated the thermometer out in the entryway. Um, it does need some repairs, so I'm going to take it home. The great paper we've been using tends to fall apart when you try and move the dial. <laughs> so I'm going to get that prepared and have that, but that has been brought up to date. So um, you'll see, if you look at that, our line for income is actually pretty close to our line for expenditures. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. The thermometer has been taken down, Linda, and it's on a chair back there. To <laughs> repair. Okay. Who wants to talk? No one wants to talk, come on. I get it. We all want cake. <laughs> I just want to thank the council. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Please keep it up. And I only have a suggestion. When we get to the point where we do have a call committee, could we, I suggest that we take a, a wide range of people, some older members, some younger members, and people in between, and that way we get a broad spectrum of, of our congregation and our needs, I believe. Thank I you. agree. That will happen. Anyone else? Uh, Dick, how much say will the Senate have and who would pay? The Senate, to the best of my understanding, sends candidates based on what we submit to the Senate. And in the, for instance, in the last selection five years ago, I think there were nine candidates sent, and we accepted the ninth, I believe. So we have quite a bit of discretion, but we don't want to milk the cow dry either. The Senate controls the supply of pastors. We need to remember that. And yes, we want the type of pastor will serve us best, no doubt about that. Joe. Well, we, uh, the last time we called the pastor, we did a survey for the congregation, and will we be doing that again? Yes, we will. Okay. Yeah. People are reading dream. <laughs> I love it. Why does the pastor not do communion? Why doesn't he do the whole communion? When did that start? I've never been in a church where the pastor did not serve the whole table. Now here's a situation where I'm in the exact middle, so I'm going to duck out. Would you please direct us to the pastor? Good question. I think uh, I'm just coming forward to give you a mic. <laughs> I haven't lost my touch. When, when I'm a 
was invited to be the interim pastor here, uh, part of my contract is that I will not change a lot that's in worship. That was the practice that uh, we had uh, another set of lay uh, leaders that uh, half of them would serve half the congregation and I would serve the other half. Personally, um, I would like to be able to serve everyone, at least now and then. Uh, it's my chance to connect with everyone in the congregation. I think that's a real strong bond that needs to continue uh, at least from time to time so that I get to say at the end of service, well, I've, I've been the good father, I've been the good pastor, I've touched each and every one in this congregation on that morning. So uh, that will be an issue that will be presented to the next uh, Worship and Music Committee meeting uh, this Wednesday, so if you have any input, please see myself or Paul or Crystal uh, as we make up the bulk of the Worship and Music Committee. So uh, please uh, prayerfully consider that um, for personal preference. Yes, I would like to be able to serve the entire congregation, and uh, but I am here to follow along with practices that have been established in this congregation. I could see that happening once or twice a month. What do you think of that? I think originally that was set up to uh, expedite communion uh, to save time. Um, why can't the pastor serve on one side one week and serve on the other, you know, alternate so that he does get the chance to serve everybody? That would be interesting. Thank you. And the Worship and Music Committee would consider this that. The other thing I have about that is that I would like to see the person that is serving, if they know your name and you're wearing your name tag, to say your name when they're giving you your wine or your host to personalize it. Because some of the people do not do that, even though I'm wearing my name. I just want to say in, in reference to Linda, I'm up front a lot and I serve a lot of people. There are visitors who do not have, who wish to not wear a name tag. I do not know everybody's name in the congregation. So if you are wearing a name tag but the person next to you is not, I feel like if I address you by your name and unless I say, what is your name real quick? I'm kind of sliding the person and not personalizing it to them. That's the reason. If I'm up front and I see that you're next to somebody that I don't know, they don't have their tag on, I'm not going to address the people surrounding them for fear of them feeling that. As you know, do you understand what I mean? That's that's me personally, though. So that's how I. I'm sorry, I don't mean my. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Arlene, that's a good point, but I, I personally try to address everybody. I kind of know most people's names, but I do call you by name. I hope if I'm neglecting somebody, I, I try not to do that. But, right. but most people do wear name tags, and we try to use mm -hmm. names. But I, as to the point of I think it was always done this way. That that's why the pastor alternates from one side to the other. That's why we move back and forth. Is but Pastor Marilyn did have us go on Intention Sunday. She would move from one side to the other every other month, so that she didn't always serve on the one side or the other. So that can happen too. I know some people would prefer to have. Pastor serve. Now, they prefer to have pastor serve as opposed to an assistant. And I can certainly understand. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have brought this up, but you know, as long as we're talking about communion, uh, in this day and age, I don't understand why anyone would be drinking out of the chalice anymore with mustaches and snarfing and God only what or why are we, why is anyone drinking out of the chalice except for Pastor Jim when everyone else is done? 
So, I mean, it's completely unsanitary, and I, I've never been in a church in any recent history where people still drink out of the chalice. Worship and music has a lot to talk about. <laughs> Anyone else? Please, now is your time. Joe. I think that's a matter of choice, which what we're all about is choice. And uh, I've never heard of anybody getting ill because of that. But uh, if that needs to be changed, I, I think everybody should be considered. I personally prefer the chalice because our Lord drank from the chalice. Thank you. Since we're talking about communion, I would like for the pastor to welcome everyone to the Lord's table. We've always, in the past, not always, but we've had that said, and for someone coming for the first time, I think that's very important. How the secretary's getting all of this? No. <laughs> We're discussing the age of the prospective pastor. I think that's a very important consideration. Uh, we need to have someone that is young enough to be forward-looking and be able to relate to any possible <laughs> youth that we might be able to entice to come to our services. But at the same time, looking around, we need to have someone that is young at heart but that also uh, can really relate very well to, uh, to the elderly people among us. And because, let's face it, uh, the, the majority of this congregation is elderly. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, a process Hopefully we'll not see a lot of people leave the congregation before we get a pastor. Uh, my only concern is that I hope we don't die before we get a new pastor. Are you talking about me? <laughs> One of my concerns as president as to hope to meet the call committee before my term expires. <laughs> to, uh, to discuss with them some very important issues about the attitude of the pastor we want. For instance, one thing that has divided our church is do we want a pastor who primarily talks about the love of God or social issues? That's a key issue that we've got to face one way or another, however it's decided. Not up to me. But we need to talk about that, as well as others like the age of the pastor. I think you all know I was an interim pastor, like Pastor Jim, for seven years, and I was the Midwest, which is a little different than Florida, but I'd like to uh, add a note of reality. There's currently a shortage of people going into the ministry who want to be pastors. And so, I'm not sure that you will get nine candidates to consider. Most congregations do not. Um, Florida might be different because there's a lot of retired people or people who want to retire down here who ask for a call down here. So maybe, but then once again, 
you're close to retirement age. Um, so you have to adjust your expectations that there will not be nine candidates to look at. And then something else to consider is before you get a name for the synod, the synod will send your packet to the pastor to consider. They have to say yes so that they will let their name come forward. And that's why it's important uh, what you write and what you say. And the more conditions and um, stipulations you put down narrows the possibility of people saying, yes, I will consider this call. So um, you can express that you would like a younger person and um, other things, but that you may not get any candidates. So um, prayer is an amazing thing. The synod, every synod I worked with, wants to make a good match because they don't want to go through this again very quickly. They want to find the best candidate they can for this congregation, and they will work very hard at doing that. But times have changed. So prayer helps immensely in getting a good match. Uh, may I say to add on, just, I don't think we should get too hung up on this business of age. Because we, if you think about it, some people are old at 49. <laughs> so, you know, through interviews and so forth, I can actually determine what the outlook is on that particular candidate. I am one for changes. Um, times have changed. Some of us are old at 49, some of us are not old when we're 89 in our minds. We need to have someone that can relate to the elderly, but also someone that can relate to the younger people. And there are plenty of people out there that may not be going into the ministry. I happen to know of two young ladies that just is going into the ministry. One just got a call. They are young, and they are great with elderly people. However, you get a lot of wisdom and experience from an older person. So I don't think we should even think about age. I think it should be their love for people, the people that they can communicate with. Horace is next. In the uh, conversations we're having about uh, uh, the Senate and that we have to actually look to the Senate for our existence. And, and I understand it's protocol. But I submit to you that there's a lot of people out there that don't know about us beyond the Senate. A lot of people who have pastoral capabilities, who are Lutherans. Um, is there any reason why we can't go beyond the Senate and solicit ourselves some, <coughs> excuse me, some way we know that the internet 